Will you join me for our affirmation? Praise the Eternal One. Praise God's mighty acts of creation and the wonders of the universe. We give thanks for beauty and goodness. Praise the Holy One for hope that is not extinguished. We give thanks for God's promise of justice and peace. Let us praise and worship our God. So good morning. Happy Father's Day and Juneteenth Sunday. It's very good to see all of you here this morning. I invite you to take a moment to share a warm hello with each other. If you're visiting, we extend a special welcome to you, and we invite you to join us in the fellowship hall following the service for our coffee fellowship. I would also like to take a moment to say thank you to everyone who helped with our Lavender Festival activities yesterday, and especially thank you to Sharon, who came up with the idea and followed it through and enlisted all of you wonderful helpers. It was a fun time, and uh, we, we just had a good time. So thank you very much. Please note the calendar on the back of the bulletin. Inreach meets on Tuesday and the church board meets on Wednesday. And please note the special thoughts and prayers list. And as always, please keep these folks in your prayers throughout the week. And now as we enter into this time of worship, let us consider these words from Father Gregory Boyle. Sooner or later, we all discover that kindness is the only strength there is. Will you join me for our first hymn, number 21? Will you join me for prayer? 
creative spirit of life. We gather this Father's Day with gratitude for those people in our lives who have nurtured us and guided us, supported us and uplifted us, who have cheered for us, comforted us, and shown us unconditional love. Because these people may have passed on from us, we acknowledge that this day may also be tinged with sadness and grief. Because these people have stood in for absent fathers or for those who could not provide for us, we also acknowledge that this day may bring heartache and emptiness. And because we have been cared for by many throughout our lives, We also are grateful for this community that reminds us that love comes from many directions and that assures us of our worth and loveliness. We now lift to you in silent meditation both the gratitude and the grief we bring this day. Amen. Will you join me for the responsive reading? In every moment of genuine love, as Paul Tillich observes, we are dwelling in God and God in us. Family relationships, friendship, marriage, and parenting give us a chance to get love right. We also practice loving All of the world's religions point to the power of love and the obligation to love our neighbors. The radical Jesus challenges us further to love our enemies.
Good morning. It's so wonderful to see all of you this morning. Thank you for being here. I know summer gets very, very busy and people are on the go, so I'm glad you can be here today. Okay. Who knows what today is? It's Father's Day. Isn't that wonderful? A day to celebrate our dads. And I hope you all have a wonderful day celebrating your dad today. And if that can't happen today, sometimes dads get busy too. Another day. Okay. I'm going to put that right there. Here's a harder question. Who knows what Wednesday is? What is Wednesday? Okay. Let me give you a hint. <laughs> Today's the 16th. Monday's the 17th. Tuesday's the 18th, Wednesday's the 19th, so June 19th is a day we celebrate that's called Juneteenth. That's a fun name, I like to say it, Juneteenth. Okay, who knows what Juneteenth is all about? It's kind of like celebration has been around for a while, but we've only been recognizing it nationally for a few years, so you may not have heard about it. Let me give you a little history. On June 19th, 1865, that was 159 years ago, the very last people who were enslaved in Texas found out that they were free. This was two years, two months after the war was over, but they hadn't heard because they didn't have a way to communicate it. So they heard, they were free, and there was a big celebration. Everybody was very happy. And it was worth celebrating. And they called it Juneteenth. So why do you think we're celebrating it now? No, I mean, why do we celebrate it in 2024 instead of, I mean, it's 159 years later. Why are we still celebrating Juneteenth? To, like, remember history so we don't repeat it. Yeah, that's great. Remember history so we don't repeat it. Very good. And also to celebrate the freedom of the black Americans. Okay. Now, Juneteenth has its own special flag. So I want to talk about that flag today. Here are the pieces of the flag. We're actually going to put it together. Okay, what colors do you see? Red, white, and blue. Why do you think they have red, white, and blue? It's a way of saying that the people who were enslaved and their descendants are Americans. Okay, now you notice this red piece has a curve to it. I actually wrote these things in. What do you think, and it goes right there, what do you think that curve represents? Can you take that on there? It doesn't have to be perfect. Just what do you think that curve represents? What does it remind you of? How about a horizon? So the curve represents a horizon, and the horizon represents the future. So it's a way of saying that the future is full of promise and opportunities. Thank you, Ruby. You're doing good. And James, I'll let you put one more on the end. Okay. Next we have the start. What do you think the star represents? Okay, that's good. That's good. Where do we see stars? Okay. We see stars on our American flag, but also on the Texas flag. It's called the Lone Star State because they have one star on their flag. So the one star reminds us that the last people to hear about their freedom were from Texas. And also, that on the American flag, there is a star for every state. So in all of this great nation, everybody is free. Okay, who knows what this is called? 
a burst. So it's like a star burst. Uh, astronomers would say it represents a nova, a new star. So it represents a new beginning for the people who were once enslaved. Okay. Put that there, put that there, and then finally, they have the date on it, June 19th, 1865. Very important day. So that goes there. Maybe, can you help me again? Uh, and Sarah, if you can, yeah. Just like the did before, just put it maybe there, that's good. Yep, yep, and away, that's good. Perfect. Thank you. There, I can do the other side. There we go. So there is our June tank flag. Uh, so Wednesday, think about it. Think about June tank and how important it is for everyone in our country to have freedom and opportunity. And thank you for being here. And you all have fun with Miss Patricia and have fun in Sunday school. Will you join me for our next hymn, number 292? When Jesus said to consider the lilies of the field, he was reminding us to not be so focused on the worries of the day that we miss the many blessings. As we consider our blessings this morning, we are invited to give as we are able so that others may be blessed by the ministry of this church.
loving God. We take these gifts from the blessings of our lives, but also from the challenges. For just as we have received love and support in the good times and bads, so we also give that same love and support to others. We ask your blessings on these gifts that this church will be able to help those in need. Amen. Our scripture reading today is probably Jesus' most famous parable from the Gospel of Luke. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? The expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. Will you join me for prayer and silent reflection? God of mercy, we know this parable forward and backward. We know what it means and the correct answer to the question, who is my neighbor? Our hearts burgeon with that warm, fuzzy feeling for all people, a genuine compassion, the diverse humanity that you call your children. It's in the details that we get lost. How are we supposed to respond when resources are limited? When immigration surges? When ideologies clash? How are love and fear supposed to coexist? And so we ask this morning for the love that doesn't shrink from the details. A love that lives courageously, even recklessly. When reckless means admitting that everyone deserves compassion and justice. We ask for the love that reflects your love. Sacrificial, unconditional, never-ending. And we ask for the courage to bear that love for all. Amen. One thing I learned when
when my own children were very small, is that children are excellent mimics, like little ducklings following their mother. I suppose that's how they learn the skills for being human, pulling themselves to walk on two feet when four was working just fine, putting spoon to mouth rather than shoving food in with their grubby little fists. Every move we make is examined and copied, sometimes with humorous results. For example, when Eric was young and Laura was a baby, housework took a back seat in our home. You might even say it was in the trunk or even accidentally left on the driveway when we packed the car. So one day I told Eric I needed to clean. And always a helper he wanted to clean to. So we started running through the house, picking up the toys and clothes and just throwing them willy-nilly. Total chaos, which was not helping the state of my house. I started to caress them, but then I realized in those hectic days, cleaning usually meant a quick breath, relocating mounds of toys and laundry and dishes, etc., to a more appropriate location, which usually meant, I confess, tossing things into various rooms, not the dishes, of course, but the toys and the clothes. So what looked like madness in Eric's attempt to clean was actually his three-year-old self recreating what he saw me doing. They absorb everything. Our habits, our moods, our conditioned responses to stress, even our career and academic choices. You have whole families of artists, engineers, preachers, etc. Which is not to say that children are blank slate born without personality or preference. Anyone who has ever known a child knows that they all come wired in their own unique way. But it is to say that parenting is a tremendously humbling task. When we see our own quirks and imperfections mirrored in our child's behavior, we might find ourselves brushing up on our table manners, choosing an apple instead of chips, practicing patience in the checkout line, and spending less time in front of a screen. And of course, it's not just our outward actions that get mirrored. Years ago, I read a book about doing science with children. The author was drawing on her own experience of bringing science to school classrooms, usually in the form of various types of critters. And I can't remember the title or the author, but I do remember clearly her advice to check our versions to creepy, crawly things at the door. Too many times she had brought something creepy or crawly to the classroom only to have the teacher recoil in horror. And the children immediately copied her behavior, learning instantly to react not with curiosity and awe, but with disgust and fear. And it's not just the fear of bugs that gets passed on. These spongy children are absorbing other, more significant aversions and prejudices, fears, and insecurities. In one of our recent Bible study meetings, we discussed messages that we ourselves have absorbed as children. Oftentimes, these messages were not communicated directly, and perhaps not even intentionally. But somehow our culture had conveyed to us as children that some groups of people are less desirable, less worthy, and less human than others. Certainly, 
Jesus' audience had inherited the notion that Samaritans were bad and vice versa. And if you know the history, you see both groups had substantial reason to view the other with suspicion. But now Jesus is telling them a parable that forces their prejudice out into the open and raises the question, where does history end and prejudice begin? As with all of his parables, Jesus was asking his audience to do a literal mental spring cleaning, so to speak, of their unexamined and taken for granted assumption. Now, spring cleaning is a daunting and tedious task. When faced with overflowing closets and drawers, attic and basement, how do we decide what is worth keeping? Tidiness guru Marie Kondo advises us to hold each item in our hand and to ask, does it spark joy? Just joy. Nothing less than that will do. Not tolerance, not reluctant acceptance, and certainly not disgust. Those things that don't pass the spark joy test get tossed. So I'm wondering, can we do the same thing with our ideas? Ask if they spark joy. And if we can, should we? Certainly Jesus didn't have the benefit of Marie Kondo's model. But when he asked which of the three was a neighbor, he was forcing the audience to hold an idea in their hands and to consider it carefully. To consider what kind of life that idea was leading them toward. Now, the lawyer may have been expecting a simple answer to his question, who is my neighbor? What he got was this story of a man in a ditch. And by the way, we are the man in the ditch. And then Jesus sends a priest and a Levite to pass by this ditch. And please don't read too much into those characters. Jesus is setting up the expectation for the audience. He is not criticizing priests and Levites. As Amy Jill Levine writes, mention a priest and a Levite to anyone who knows anything about Judaism, and they will know that the third person is going to be an Israelite. So the lawyer, the audience, and very likely the man in the ditch expect an Israelite to come by next and offer aid. But Jesus sends a Samaritan instead. And this Samaritan, described by the lawyer, the audience, and most certainly by the man in the ditch, puts himself at great risk by stopping on this dangerous road, giving his time and valuable resources to save this man. Which of the three was the neighbor? So ingrained were his prejudices, the lawyer cannot even utter the word Samaritan. But while history may explain our prejudices, the future urges us to hold them in our hands and acknowledge how they are affecting our lives. Levine wrote back in 2014, Samaria today has various names. The West Bank, Occupied Palestine, Greater Israel. To hear the parable today, we only need to update the identity of the figures. I am an Israeli Jew on my way from Jerusalem to Jericho, and I am attacked by thieves, beaten, Stripped, robbed, and left half dead in a ditch. Two 
few people who should have stopped passed me by. The first, a Jewish medic from the Israel Defense Forces. The second, a member of the Israel-Palestine Mission Network of the Presbyterian Church, USA. But the person who takes compassion on me and shows me mercy is a Palestinian Muslim whose sympathies lie with Hamas, a political party whose charter not only anticipates Israel's destruction, but also depicts Jews as subhuman demons responsible for all of the world's problems. Today, ten years later, it is nearly impossible to imagine such a scenario of compassion, which makes all the more urgent the question, which of the three was the neighbor? Which of the three reached out to help, crossing cultural boundaries and ignoring the enmity in the heart of the victim to offer aid? And then we must turn the spotlight on ourselves. If we were lying in a ditch, who is the last person we would want to hack and by to clean and bind our wounds and carry us to safety? Who would that person be who even after putting themselves at risk by stopping on that dangerous road and giving their time and resources who would we still not be able to acknowledge by name? A transgender woman? A homeless man? Someone from south of our border? A Christian nationalist? A flaming liberal? Levine poses this question for us. And we finally agree that it is better to acknowledge the humanity and the potential to do good in the enemy. Yes, of course we can agree. But it's a daunting and tedious task. So here's a thought. One day a while back, when I was falling into that decluttering trap that goes something like this. But what if we might need it for something we can't even imagine someday far down the road? And my husband said, throw it out. If we need it, we'll buy another one. And that was such a liberating idea that allowed me to let go of those things that were not sparking joy. Very, very few of which I actually missed. Now I admit that what I'm fixing to say may sound like an audacious idea, bordering on the absurd and far too simple to work. But perhaps we can use this same tactic to help us let go of ideas that are weighing us down. Fears, suspicions, prejudices, and hatred that are leading us away from the joy for which we create, we were created. But that somehow, perhaps subconsciously, we're afraid that we can't live without. Just let them go see if we can live without them. Chances are pretty good we'll find that we can. The children are watching us, learning from us how to be human in this world. Let us have the courage to give them a world that is worthy of them. Amen. Will you join me for our final hymn, number 395?
leave this place. May we be emboldened by the audacious, absurd idea that the only label we ever need to give another is neighbor. And let us go and be neighbor to each other. Amen.